something. So does Breath of the Wild have spaceships? Uh, no. No, okay. I, I consider that a failing of the game, but... Uh, right, right. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss the scale of game worlds. When can compression break immersion? And at what point does big become boring? Plus, a listener asks about mobile games, and we debut a new segment, Reading List. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 96 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Why does Jim always get to go first? Uh, because I try to intentionally steal what you're going to say, <laughs> and it just kind of throws you off, and you're like, oh, yeah, I was going to say that. I can't say it now. It, it's, it's basically... It's mainly because it's like vocal <laughs> muscle memory. I have this very specific routine of here's what I say in what order. And if I throw it off, then I probably start to stumble too much. No wonder you're good at video games. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Doc. Uh, so uh, today we have a uh, kind of our part two of two discussing open world games. Now, this one isn't specifically open world, but it ties in very closely. We're talking about scale, um, how big the game world is that you're playing in. Mm. Um I think, generally speaking, a lot of us think the games feel a little bit small, um, even the ones that are supposed to be just these really massive experiences. Um, sometimes. Or sometimes they maybe. try to make you think they're massive experiences, but actually aren't. Maybe we, maybe we can talk about uh, a reverse of that problem. You know, maybe mm-hmm. there's some examples of games that are just maybe too big. Mm-hmm. Who yep. knows? Yep. Uh, so it should be an interesting discussion. But first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So here's a game that's definitely not too big. Uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I talked a little bit about it uh, a couple of weeks ago. You you actually challenged me, Jim, to see whether or not I was still playing it. Um, Oh, yes. I am definitely not still playing it. I have finished it. Uh, I need to get the Jack the Ripper content and play that. I've been told it's pretty good, but um, I haven't haven't done that yet. I still borrowed my dad's copy, and so I haven't actually put down any money on it. But I wanted to talk about something that I, I neglected to talk about, and, and it's really kind of interesting. It's the World War I content of uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which I don't really know that many people were talking about. The World War I content, I thought the game takes place before World War I. Yeah, a Victorian era. Right. So. And it's about twins and, and all of this. I mean, I guess technically it's not that far well, no. In, in the past from World War One, It isn't, still. and that's the point. If you go uh, into about uh, episode six, it's called sequence six, if you know your AC lore, um, you're going to notice on the far right of the map, in the Thames River, a weird icon shows up. There's this thing called the time anomaly. It's going to transfer you, uh, transport you in, in, into the future, and basically what, what it's going to be is it's going to take you to uh, World War One. Now, now, just to confirm, is this is this DLC or is this like free? No, new content? this is part of the main game. It's part of the main game. It oh, feels like DLC because it's it's kind of optional content, and not only that, but you your your character is completely different. The stuff you have doesn't come with you, um, but. A, a very young Winston Churchill, as in World War II, right, uh, when he's still working for the Secret Service, mm. uh, recruits you to go do some spy stuff and to, you know, find the spies who are lurking around in London. Now, the map is different. It's actually in the Tower Bridge area, which if you know your London at all, you know the Tower Bridge is really close to the Tower of London. And there's one mission which is there. So I kind of get the feeling that they were like, hey, we only used this map once. Can we use it again? <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll create a whole thing and we'll do it in World War One and blah, 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 blah. Um, but what, what ends up happening is there's about seven or eight, maybe nine missions uh, to find the spies, and then you're just done. And it's a really tight-knit little story that's very, very enjoyable, um, and it feels completely out of place. It's almost like they just didn't have 
a good reason for it. And so they, hmm. they stuck it in there as an afterthought. Do, do you think this could be a preview for just to kind of see the feedback if people like that setting, to possibly do a set, that setting for the next Assassin's Creed? Well, given that... Or possibly a new game from Ubi? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, given that U- Ubi has a thing in their Assassin's Creed games now, have for a long time, mm. where it's like, rate this mission. Yeah. And, and you can press the triangle button and be like, I liked this mission a lot, five stars. Or I hated this mission, two stars. Yeah. You know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> and, I hated it. But I'm still giving it two stars. Right. Um, (laughs) It's entirely possible. Right. I wouldn't put it past them. Um, AC has gotten really, really samey. Basically, once you you get into it for the, wow, cool, I'm in London in the Victorian era, that's that's really kind of fun. After an hour or two, yeah. Yeah, you're basically doing the same thing. You basically just see the same shapes game of the buildings playing. and you see yeah. a new place. Yeah. 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 Um, it's so, like Far Cry has had that same problem for yeah, a while. Yeah, that's very true. Which is why I liked when they liked Blood Dragon so much, because it felt like they were sort of playing with that concept. Mm-hmm. It became a joke and they were they were more self aware, I felt. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, you're right. I mean that happens. That's been a kind of a problem with Ubi games in general. Well, re- repetitive elements in games are just a problem. And right, you can make the true. same argument for just about any game. You learn the vocabulary of their game, you play it. Uh, they introduce new stuff, people complain because they're like it was completely out of mm-hmm. place. Uh, you know, I, I like, think like we talked about last week with Zelda. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it, it was in a rut for a while and they had now they've sort mm-hmm. of changed it quite a bit, but it was in a rut. So. Yeah, you know, I, I think back to the Leonardo content mm-hmm. of um, AC, I guess it was 2. Yeah. And, you know, there was some really interesting stuff in there with the flying machine and all of that. But um, anybody who didn't immediately take to the flying machine's mechanics is going to remember the, the reference, shoot, shoot the flying demon, because they heard that cut scene about nine times <laughs> yeah. prior to finally being able to beat that because it was an unskippable long cut scene before learning the new mechanic of, oh, updraft. Got it. And so... Anyway, all of that is to say that um, if you did not play or did not know about the World War I sequence in uh, AC Syndicate, I'm not sure how you could have if you beat the game, um, but it's really worth checking out. Um, you know, catch a Let's Play or something, because I thought it was a very neat, little, tight-knit story. How, how long does it take to work through it? You say about a couple oh, hours? Oh, maybe an hour, hour, hour? and a half. Okay. Yeah, it's just, it's not a, it's not a big thing. It was kind of neat because, um, you know, the meta story that's always with AC, which mm-hmm. is that you're now the person who's playing in the real world, and uh, Ubi has licensed out to Abstergo, and blah, 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 blah. Um, your, your handler basically says, what, where are you? Where are you going? I lost contact with you. And then you go away and... At the end of it, what you get is um, there's these sort of alien gods, if you will, um, who are, are trying to be reborn into our world. And when that happens, that's going to be a really bad thing. And that's that's the sub-meta plot of all the AC games. And that's the only place where she appears. And she sort of hijacks the game to tell this story is the argument. Um, and so it's, it's meta. It's fun. Um, but it's, um, I don't know, it's... It was unusual to me. It was so completely jarring and out of place that it was good. Yeah, it does definitely sound different. Mm-hmm. I'll say that. Very different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, some of my recent uh, D&D experiences playing through 5e with a group of friends. Uh, I know last time I talked, I talked a little bit about Murder Hobos as a concept. Yes, you um, did. Well, this time I want Is this going to be as cool as Murder Hobos? I hope so. Okay. I hope so. Well, this time around, uh, one of our players has had trouble showing up, and we can't really continue the game until until all of us are present. So what we decided to do was pl- uh, our, our GM sort of asked if anybody else wanted to run like a side campaign mm-hmm. with just less people, and he because he actually wanted to play some too. So we agreed. One, there is uh, another. One of our players decided to go ahead and be a GM, and came up with a new campaign. So we all rolled new characters. Well, both myself and another one of my friends, unbeknownst to each other, <laughs> had the same idea for a general idea for a character, and that's basically to, to have a big brutish idiot <laughs> that has no sense of like. Um, Danger, like personal, oh, personal, uh, a barbarian. Yes, a barbarian, but like actually playing up, the, like not not trying to metagame it. We want to su- survive. No, playing it completely straight because we're so stupid and we don't understand that we might actually die. So we're just gonna like go straight into into combat <laughs> or like do things that are stupid. The thing, now, the, the twist on on mine, and, and I actually 
did talk to uh, make sure that this was okay. I'm actually playing a monster race, which is an option in, in 5e. Hmm. So I'm playing a um, bugbear monster race. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so I am a bugbear barbarian, a bugbear bar. <laughs> um, and my backstory, I have, a, I have a six intellect, so I actually took a negative intellect, not because bugbears have that as a racial trait, mm-hmm. because I asked permission to take negative two points on my int so I could have, like, one extra stat point oh somewhere else. Oh, my goodness. Just because I wanted to, but I also wanted to play it stupid. Um, I actually wanted to take even less int, but later found out that if you go below six, you may not be able to communicate. <laughs> And as part of my character, <laughs> I'm actually I took the uh, entertainer background because I wanted to be a traveling entertainer. And my story is that I'm not evil as a bugbear. First of all, um, I'm just really dumb. I'm a brute, but I'm not evil. So you're not feral. No, you're so you're, you're a tame. Bugbear. I'm tame. And what I what I want to do is I want to travel the world and um, share my experiences as a uh, essentially a stand up comic. So I'm a traveling sort of jester, like comic. But my charisma, my charisma is also low too. My charisma is eight. So if, if for those that know, ten for ten you get a zero modifier. With eight, you still have a negative one modifier. So I have uh, only, even though I'm proficient in performance, I only have a bonus of plus one anytime I roll a performance check. Do you so, juggle? Uh, sometimes I juggle squirrels. Before, oh, um, it didn't go over well. Uh, some of my performances include: I have actually in the middle of battle um, put on a performance. I've actually in the middle of battle said, "Okay, I'm going to roll a performance check here," and my my GM is starting to like be like, "What? Wait, you're what are you doing? You can't do that." I'm like, "Well, I'm going to do it. I'm rolling performance." But you're in the middle of combat. He's going to attack you next turn. I know. I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm stupid. Why are you doing that? That's dumb. It's like I know. I I know. I'm stupid. <laughs> My character I have is a dumb. Six <laughs> intellect. <laughs> and surprisingly, it doesn't work. And and part of that was. Um, oh really? Yes. Oh what a shock! It's surprisingly, it doesn't seem to work. Um, I did. I did actually. I was actually able to pull off a few performances. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have this thing where I figure because I'm a brute and I'm also trying to do performance and stand up comedy that I have before taken um, the bodies of. Like the like these like rat people that mm-hmm, I found, mm-hmm. which for some reason my character calls lizard men. Uh-huh. I don't know. I don't know why are lizards, um, because I accidentally called them something else and it just stuck. So I've I've taken their bodies as like trophies, even though we weren't supposed to act. They didn't ask for trophies as part of this quest. I just decided that I was going to bring him back as a trophy, and then I slammed slammed him down, and then I took my I have a giant maul like which is a big hammer, two handed mm-hmm. hammer, and smashed the guy's head. I mean he's already dead, but I smashed his his head. Because my, my thinking was Gallagher, watermelon break. Right. Yeah. Yeah, everybody loves Gallagher. Of He's course. hilarious. Of, we'll see. But by the bug bugbear negative. Uh, oh, was the king in the splash six. zone? Yes, he was in the splash zone. Oh. Um, so it didn't go over very well. Um, I also, did, also didn't help that it didn't roll particularly well either as my performance check. I'm still waiting to do something like that because I'm hoping that at one point I'll do it and I'll roll a nat 20. And he's just gonna have to deal with it. Like, some, <laughs> just deal with it. He enjoyed my performance. All right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's actually quite fun. Um, just talking with people is fun because I'll just blurt out something that is just completely off the wall, crazy. Mm-hmm. Then my other friend, who also has six cent, will back me up. And then we have one wizard that's with us too, who has an eighteen intelligence. <laughs> but uh, he's also evil, so he just he just lets us go on about nothing or encourages us to do stupid, even stupider things. So it's actually become quite a fun campaign for us, but I, I suspect our GM is not having as good of a time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you kind of have to roll with it with players like you, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so have you have you played Fallout and done and this with a like a really dumb oh, character? Ba- where I, you get I did just back the dots. In the day. Mm-hmm. I did that back with um, it's either Fallout one or two. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I did I did go through with a super low int character. It's fun. It is. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of was my inspiration, was to go oh, super low end, but I also realized I, I still wanted to be able to communicate a little bit, mm-hmm. so I didn't want to go below six, and I set a few extra rules for myself. The other one was, I can't metagame it. I can't like act like, well, I shouldn't do this because my character might die. I have to think about, well, no, my character would do this because he doesn't understand that he might die. Yeah. So I'm intentionally, I almost died in the very first combat round that we had, the mm-hmm. very first one. I got down to one HP. <laughs> well, you know, it, it seems to me like it would be a lot easier to role play dumber than you actually are than it would be oh, to I role agree. play smarter oh, than you actually so are. It's so true. That is so true. Where you get to those moments where you're like, okay, um, my my science physics, I know nothing about, but my character would know yeah. this. So, GM, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> and then the GM's like, 
I don't yeah, know either. either. Right, right. <laughs> That's very true. It, except for the except for the meta element, like I said, because there's always that temptation where you're like, oh, but I mean, if I but, do this, I, I might die. lose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you kind of have to fight against that and go, no, go with it, roll with it, mm-hmm. yeah. for fun. For fun. <laughs> We have a show called Roll With It. Yeah, yeah we, we do. do. We do. Where we play real role-playing games, not D&D. <laughs> <laughs> they're all real. Just different they're games. all real. They're just different styles. Cool. Now is the time for Reading List, in which our impeccable curators recommend the finest materials for your reading, listening, and viewing pleasure. All right, so this is a new segment we're calling Reading List. This is basically when we have something that we want to share that we think is really uh, a good watch or a good listen or a good read uh, that has something to do with what it is we deal with here. Um, oh, I have to read. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. It's up to you. These are just, these are just recommendations. Is this a kissing book? Uh, no, this is not a kissing book. Okay. Um, that would be the other stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So there's the other stuff where we talk about stuff that's not game related, and there's uh, also um, Let's Watch, Let's Play, but that is, of course, more dealing with Let's Play specifically. So for this first uh, iteration of Reading List, I want to mention a YouTuber called Mark Brown. Um, he has a uh, channel that's under his name, but his show, if you want to call it that, is called Game Maker. Toolkit. Mm. And basically what he does is it's kind of these um, short format videos, uh, usually somewhere between like 5 and 15 minutes depending, Mm. uh, where he talks about uh, these different concepts. It actually reminds me a lot of our own stuff, just whereas we talk about it more in like a long form podcasting thing, he sort of like narrows it down into kind of an article style format and then just has video to back it up. Oh, he keeps on topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you say so. Right, unlike us. Yeah, unlike us. <laughs> um, uh, but so there's some really interesting stuff on there. Like one, for instance, that I'll mention that uh, kind of harkens back to what we talked about last week. Um, puzzle-solving games versus problem-solving games. Uh, where basically the idea is that we have puzzle games, and we tend to think of a lot of games and sort of lump them into puzzle-solving. Right. Um, but that's when, like, you know, we got a problem, and you're just trying to find the solution. Or you're trying to solve the puzzle. Uh, as the name would imply. Um, But problem-solving games are more like we give you an obstacle, we give you an objective, something like that, we give you a problem, and then we're going to give you a tool set and you figure out how to solve it yourself. You're not looking for our solution, you're generating a player solution. It's like like what we talked about last week. So it's like Breath of the Wild, where Mm -hmm. it gives you all these possible ways to approach a problem, Mm -hmm. as opposed to you need to figure out the one way that we've chosen you must approach the problem to solve it. Mm-hmm. There no, are a lot of abstract examples of this. One, yes. An old classic that I used to love is The Incredible Machine. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you remember that that old one. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of little sort of cheap free games where it's like, solve this problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I like those little yeah. crunchy ones. So a really excellent series of videos. Another one that I thought was really interesting that I showed you at one point, Doc, was mm-hmm. uh, Morality. Yeah. Um, and how Good one. there are games that uh, portray morality through the system of the game rather than sort of having the sort of preachy, binary, karma-based system like other games might have. <laughs> um, like the ridiculous, the way that it's become in Bioware games. <laughs> yeah. Which I despise the way they do mor- their morality system. is so binary and... You're going to lose karma for saying that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Come on. Um, and then another really excellent sort of spin-off series is called Boss Keys, where what he's doing, he wants to do at some point a video where he talks about dungeon design in Legend of Zelda uh, and how Nintendo does it. Uh, but in order to feel like he was qualified to talk about that, um, he wants to go back and play every single dungeon in every single Legend of Zelda game. Uh, that so, seems reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> no! Um, so it's been a long-term project, obviously. Uh, but he has been going back, and he'll actually analyze a few of the dungeons in each of these games. He kind of goes game to game. So, like, one time he talks about... Um, you know, Ocarina of Time, one time he talks about Oracle and or Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons. Um, and he actually has this really clever uh, way of charting out the dungeon that I think is really cool, where he talks about how um, here are the doors, here are the keys, or rather like a lock and a key, if you want to put it that way. And you can sort of visualize like how much the dungeon branches or how... Um, how much choice the player has in their approach based on kind of like the shape of these charts. So it's doors really interesting Doors before stuff. keys, guys. Doors yep. before keys. Exactly. If you give the key before the door, the key has become the door. Mm-hmm. Just saying. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting if he's going to, to also mix in the way Breath of the Wild handles it because it mm. completely throws those conventions yeah. to the wayside. It, instead of having dungeons, it has arguably divine beasts and shrines mm-hmm. and then it also has labyrinths and these are all totally different things yeah. and none of them are really like the dungeons mm-hmm. before yeah uh, he he has a wa- uh, has a ways to go before he gets to that but he, yeah. I think he has actually alluded a few times to like and it sounds like Breath of the Wild might totally throw this all out the window so um, I'm, I mean I'm curious to see how he approaches that it will probably be quite different yeah I would ar- I would certainly argue he'd probably look at the metagame if mm-hmm. I had to guess where it's like here is the 
here is the overall game. If yeah. we treat the entire game kind of like a quote unquote dungeon, then here's what you have to do to get to the end of this dungeon. That sort of thing. Going with his with his view, which I, I love that concept of problem solving versus puzzle solving. And I mm-hmm. would say when it comes to the shrines, it's very much a problem solving because there's so many ways to approach mm-hmm. it. But I would actually argue when it comes to the divine beast, it's it's more of a puzzle yeah. solving co- approach. Wouldn't the, you agree? The divine beasts are probably the most traditionally dungeon like um, experiences in Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like I love that concept though. Yeah. I'll, have to, I'll have to go back and read some of this. Is, is it just is it, you said it's written articles or is it it's, videos? It's video articles. Vid, video articles. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you look up uh, Mark Brown on YouTube or if you look up Game Maker's Toolkit or mm. Boss Keys, uh, pretty much any of those ways will let you find them. And it's yeah. really good stuff. I don't have to read. They're, they're <laughs> enjoyable. I'm, I'm glad you turned me on to that. Yeah. Cool. This is Inbox, where the crew responds to listener questions, comments, and letters to the editor. To join the discussion, email inbox at backward-compatible.com. Guys, guys, we have another letter. Woo! Yeah, it's exciting. Another one. Um, Just th- another 10,000 people wrote in, and we, we chose the <laughs> best one. <laughs> I think it's a million. I looked it up. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, Steven... Writes, hello there. He's very cordial. Very, very, I like very cordial. It. Yeah, I've, get casual. I've recently gotten into your podcast, and I have to say, well done. He's a very perceptive mm-hmm. young man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, but no, seriously, seriously, Stephen, we appreciate that. Um, I do have a question that I don't believe you've covered, though. I'm a mobile developer who got his start making mobile games. I'm looking to get back into the mobile game dev space, but I'm a bit flummoxed by the mobile gaming space and how it has changed in the three years since I last produced a game. My questions are as follows. What specific genres slash types of games do you wish would stop being made for phones and the mobile space? And additionally, which genres or types of games do you wish would be more prevalent in the mobile space? Thanks for your time. You know, I think this goes back to previously you were talking about puzzles and problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I think that a good example of games that work – because there's some games that just don't work as well in mobile. And I think when you have a a mobile experience, what – at least what I'm looking for and what I think a lot of other people are is the ability to pick up and and play in short bursts and not feel like – Oh, I've got to save. Oh, I can't put my phone down. Uh Uh-oh, I'm about to get on the train, but uh, I can't really do anything. I better not put my phone in my pocket or I might lose progress I just made. I don't really want to feel that way. So what I like are, for example, the the, the Laura Croft uh, Go or and the other Go series like Hitman Go. Yeah, you were talking about those. Right. That series of games I think is successful because it is – and this is a puzzle solving, by the way, not problem solving. Mm -hmm. But it's fun and they have – and each map is very short. And it just sort of challenges you to solve the puzzle of this map and get your character through it. And it's part of a larger world, and that world is part of a larger series of worlds. Mm -hmm. So it's still a good amount of content because that's another thing is that you don't want to just be redoing the same thing. Yeah. Um, The other thing that I think – so and even then, I would say that's arguably even more useful than, say, uh, certain straight up – we usually consider a puzzle game. Say something like uh, a Tetris, for example. Um, in my opinion, I think Tetris works. Is, first of all, I think Tetris is, a, is, is one of the best games of all time. I mean, I don't know if we can really argue about the quality of Tetris. Well, obviously, it's not a game, but yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if I would say it was not a game. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just yeah. joking. Uh, but no, but it's it's you, know, you can play that on like an actual home system. But but it became really big on Game Boy, and which is great. And I and I, I can sort of see why someone might want to take that experience to the mobile space. But the danger there is that if you're, do, if you're in a groove on Tetris, uh-oh, what happens when you have to put your phone away? Mm-hmm. So, th- so I would almost argue that games like that, like those, those, those type of like persistent puzzlers, mm-hmm. don't really work that well in the mobile space either. Be- and the other part about that too, and, I, and at least from the way that I always played Tetris, even if you introduced save points in a puzzle game like Tetris, mm-hmm. in each level, every time you hit the next level, it would save in case you had to put it in your pocket because levels technically didn't shouldn't take you that long, mm-hmm. that wouldn't work because you have to get in a groove yeah, in you Tetris. Have to warm up, yeah. You have to warm up. So if you picked up your phone later and suddenly you're on like a super hard level, you're like ah, yeah. you're toast. <laughs> yeah. You're toast. Mm-hmm. So I think that that I I think um, a little bit more of a relaxed and um, cerebral experience mm-hmm. I think is what more of what we need on mobile games and then also a you know, get, 
time, like mm-hmm. like knowing that your audience is going to experience your game in short bursts, and how do you approach that? Mm-hmm. And there's multiple ways to approach that. And I, like I said, the Go series is a good example of, of a clever way to approach it, but you don't have to. I mean, you could have short contained levels that might be actiony, mm-hmm. but those levels are so short that you can get through them in you know say a minute and a half or something. And then you move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. And if you do something like that, you could have a game like a platformer. Mm-hmm. So you can still do some of that. The other thing you have to keep in mind with mobile games, too, are the controls. Mm-hmm. Because re- regardless of what you think about mobile games, and I've, I've come down on them before in the past, but there are good mobile games. But they have to know, again, like know your game. Like, like uh, Doc Lex, to quote Tim Schafer, know the game that you're, what is it, know the game that you're trying to make? Yeah, make the game you're make making. Make the game you're making, mm-hmm. right. So there are limitations with your phone in mm-hmm. terms of the, the interaction that you're going to have with it. And you need to recognize that and understand that if you're going to try to make, say, a, a platformer like Super Mario Bros., mm-hmm. Super, and it's going to be actually like the console home games, I'm sorry that game's going to fail because you need buttons, you need a D-pad, you need these things. So that's mm-hmm. why with Super Mario Run, they mm-hmm. didn't design it the same way. Right. Yeah, ports as, just don't work. So you can't port a game, you cannot port a game that needs a controller. Like something like, I know they recently had um, ports of, say, Mega Man for phone. Mm-hmm. Terrible. Yeah. Abysmal experience. You can't do it. You need buttons, you need mm-hmm. a D-pad. So, so think of it more as a newer experience. Something like um, the Kirby Canvas, Cur- Canvas Curse games for uh, the DS, which mm-hmm. were all touchscreen. screen. Mm-hmm. And it was a pure touchscreen experience with Kirby. I think games like that, where you're controlling the character's path and you're drawing a path for your character with a stylus, mm-hmm. could potentially work for it for a, for a mobile phone game if you use your finger. Mm-hmm. Embrace the constraints of the platform. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yes. let your limitations be opportunities. Precisely. Mm-hmm. Well, and and as I look and see what's on the App Store right now, I'm like, oh look, Oxenfree just made it over. I haven't played that yet. I am so totally not going to play it on a mobile. Yeah. Because that wasn't what it was created for. Mm-hmm. And I'm worried it will suffer. Yeah. You also don't know, like, what they changed in the port. Like, probably the graphics aren't going to be as good. Well, yeah. Um, like, you look, for example, like, Telltale. I'm, I'm not sure if they still do this, but for a while they were coming out, like, say, The Walking Dead for mobile. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, like, the, the interface is totally different. I'm sure the graphics work totally yeah. different. Yeah. Anything well, with the phrase touch edition yeah. at the end. Like, uh, Crazy Taxi. I was so excited when Crazy Taxi came to iPad mm-hmm. until I realized it was just a completely different game that was right. really... The, uh, I, I don't even want to insult it by saying it was a crazy taxi game. It, right. it, it really wasn't. <laughs> no, it's like the the, it Grand the, the earlier Grand Theft Auto games mm-hmm. have been ported to phones. I'm talking Grand Theft Auto 3, yeah. That's such San a Andreas, idea. and Vice City. That's a terrible idea. A lot of people bought them and then prob- because they like Grand Theft Auto. I don't blame you. I love, I'm love. i a huge Grand Theft Auto fan. You're yeah, going to have a tr- sure. trouble finding somebody that's as big of a fan as me. I would not touch those games on mobile with a 10-foot pole <laughs> because the controls on those early games, even with the controller, are... Kind of tough to go back to after you get into four and especially five because they've improved the control so much. Mm-hmm. On a phone, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Or, or now here's another example. This is less control, but um, JRPGs. Mm. They've actually ported a lot of the fo- pretty much all the earlier Final Fantasy games. I'm, ta- I'm, I'm talking one all the way through. I want to say seven. Well, maybe at least those even are eight. turn-based. Right now, in terms of yeah, in terms of controls, totally totally viable because you don't need. To do anything complicated, it's a, it, these are turn-based games. Like like Doc, you're saying, you, all you have to do is navigate a menu and mm-hmm. click attack. That's fine. The problem, though, is that these games are meant to be played over a long period mm-hmm. of time. They're not short burst games. Mm-hmm. JRPGs are long slog games. Yeah. You can't pick up a JRPG, play for five minutes, and feel like you accomplished anything. Well, now to be fair, I will say that I think there's that for some people having an RPG like a nice long meaty RPG on your phone could actually be a really good. Um, experience because, like, you know, some of the my favorite JRPGs have been the ones that I could sit down with on, say, my PSP or my DS. But there's a big difference there. And I agree with you mm-hmm. on, on, on when we're talking about handheld, because mm-hmm. I agree. Handheld, I think it works. Yeah. One, not just the buttons, but also there's a problem with battery life. Yeah. There's so many things that go on on your phone, not just that game, mm-hmm. that when you get a game like that, it's going to burn through, power through what you have. You can't really sit there and be as dedicated to it. That's not right. to mention, this is not set up mm-hmm. in the same way in terms of like ease of ease of holding it like a PSP or a DS or mm-hmm. a 3DS. I haven't played the Vita, but Vita is very similarly yeah. shaped to the PSP. Um, those are set up to be to fit in your hands in a way that accommodates gaming. Mm-hmm. This phone is not, mm-hmm. because it's not a game device first. So it's again, it's about knowing your mm-hmm. limitations and thinking, okay, think about what can, what can we do mm-hmm. 
it, in short bursts. But the, the benefit of that, too, is that if you design your game that it can be played in short bursts, but it's all connected, mm-hmm. then for the player that wants to play longer and has more time, they can. Yeah. But you're also not alienating mm-hmm. people that can't, and you're also giving them the option to, whenever they feel like, okay, I'm ready to move on. Like, when I'm playing... Laura Croft Go. Mm-hmm. I feel like I can pick it up and I can go, oh, I've got a minute. Here, I'll just play a level real quick. That's all I need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't at all feel bad in any way because it, it's going to save after each level about turning it off and putting it in my pocket. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Fire Emblem Heroes is another really great example of that. Mm-hmm. And even if you have to quit in the middle of a battle, um, it will basically bookmark your turn. And so when you turn it back on, it's like, hey, you were in the middle of a battle. Do you want to resume yeah. it? And, then you can and that's that. turn-based. That's but, great. They, but they intentionally scale down yeah. the size of the combats yeah. as well to sort of accommodate the mobile space, mm-hmm. which... Mm-hmm. For me, I, I'm not into it because I like the bigger stuff. Mm-hmm. I'd rather just you know pull out my 3ds and play Fire Emblem on there. Sure. But I but I do appreciate that they that they took those considerations mm-hmm. into account when they decided to make a mobile first. You know, Yu-Gi-Oh is kind of the same way. I didn't play it for very long, but um, I respected what they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My answer to the question is really simple, and it has to do with money. I'm really really sick of fake free games. I was going to oh. say that. Yeah. Um, games that have yeah, you know microtransactions in them or in app purchases. Dude, just charge me five bucks for the game, or three ninety nine, or a dollar, whatever is appropriate for your game. I'll even pay fifteen. I've done that before. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a really great game and it's not going to have ads and it's not going to have junk and it's not going to try to shove stuff down mm-hmm. my throat mm-hmm. while I'm playing, um, there are times that I buy stuff that's considered mobile games for my iPad. Which um, you know, I don't even have like the the service, so I'm only ever on Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. and whenever I'm, I'm there, and I just use it at home, and and I play um, like I play full board games with my wife, I play Carcassonne, mm-hmm. play Small World, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I love those kind of games, and and even those have additional content that you can purchase, one time fee, mm-hmm. and there's an extra expansion. Um, that's different, but whenever it's free in quotation marks and then I get into the game and I realize that to make the ads go away I have to pay or in order to actually play past the paywall I have to pay Yeah, I'm done. I, I, hate I that uninstall too. immediately. I and, and I don't I even mind the games that are like, you know, free to play where obviously if you pay money you're going to get a boost and you're going to be able to go faster and better and that sort of stuff, but like anything that's kind of like pay to win like for example in Fire Emblem like I if consider you, those the same thing it, yeah basically in Fire Emblem if I'm paying it's because I just want to get a bunch of new heroes really quickly but I can still grind and get that by conventional means I don't have to pay for that game Hearthstone's another good example where it's free to play um, and you can earn very slowly and surely um, the booster packs um, but you could also pay for those booster packs too if you want to get right. like a really mm-hmm. quick. Well, the single player content that's mm-hmm. a great example. You can play, you can earn up the what is it gold, mm-hmm. and then you can purchase those that way. That's the way I did all of those. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can just pay for it. Yeah, and I have no problem with that, mm-hmm. none whatsoever. I think so. Just as kind of like a general answer to the question, tying into that, um, it's not so much like we want to see less of this genre, more of this genre. It's more like. First of all, make it for mobile. Understand right. what mobile can and can't do and design a game around that. So, like, a franchise can come to mobile, but understand you're going to have to change things about it to make it work. That's right. Also, um, if you're going to make a free game, make it a game that, and, like, it's hard to say how to do this. It really depends on the game. Make it a game that people want to pay money for because they want to keep playing and they want to keep playing better. Not a game that they have to pay money for um, because otherwise they're not going to get anywhere, if that makes sense. I guess. I mean, it, I, I, I want to pay. I want to play. I want to pay money for it because it's a good game, yeah. and I know I'm going to have it forever. Yeah, I want to. I want to pay it once. Like, if for example, if they had done that with Go, as opposed to having just you buy the game and you now have it. Mm-hmm. If it was like each little world is an extra dollar, and you have to. No, I wouldn't want to do right. that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Get the that Mario. Sure. The Mario is a perfect example mm-hmm. for me. I, I enjoyed the three levels I had in Mario, and mm-hmm. then I realized, wait, what? Mm-hmm. The, now I have to pay. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Done. Well, that Out. One, that one was more of a. They're just giving you a, like, it, it a demo, a demo. Yeah. and then the game itself is just a one purchase thing. So that I, I think is an example. But of I felt doing it right. I still felt tricked because I did not realize up front that that's what it was. Mm-hmm. So you thought the whole they were just going to make the game and make it all free? Well, I no, I I was see that's the thing. It's I'm Nintendo. Your own it's Nintendo. Here. So they could yeah. totally have said, "Here's a free game, guys," because they're trying to get into the mobile space. No, I don't think so. I I didn't think so either. But I was really shocked and surprised yeah. that there was no price tag at the beginning. You see what I'm saying? Right. I, like, like we were saying, I think it's a, maybe they just weren't vocal enough about it being a demo. Right. But that's what it was. It was basically a demo. And if they had said demo and then unlocked the full game, that would have been a different thing. Well, anytime you download from the App Store, it says offers in-app purchases, and you can see what those are. And so you can see that, like, oh, the in-app purchase here is this much for 
the rest. I, of I think the, the problem you is you read the terms of service right. too, don't you? No, I think I the don't. problem is that Doc, <laughs> Doc and I are just uh, you know we're just too old. Old, I think, and the uh, word. we just don't get the, the the economics of the mobile space. Well, I mean, to be fair, I don't I don't play a lot of mobile <laughs> games myself, so I literally can't read anything that's on text that small. I have I have a plus for a reason. Yeah, yeah. So no, but but yeah. So I think I hope we answered your question. Mm-hmm. And if not, feel free to write back. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's, hello there. Your question, you didn't answer my question at all. <laughs> complete failures. I take back what I said about liking <laughs> your show. Terrible job. We, might, just, not, we might not read that letter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get so many of them, you know. <laughs> and now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Okay, so when you start talking about uh, these these ideas of how big is the world, you right. immediately get into problems, because one of the things that you're you're talking about is well, if if you're playing in a car, um, whether you right. can get out of the car that, or not that's get the out other of the part car, of it. that's a huge difference. Yeah. So if you're if, if you're your a, avatar is a car right. or a spaceship, I've actually heard right? that's different. I've heard racing games, for example, be described as far as miles of road rather mm-hmm. than square miles of the map. Well, that makes a lot of sense yeah. because if you can't go off the road, then basically it's it's all the the area you can see. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of play, uh, a lot of games will, will will cheat on this by having like a great big lake in the middle that you can't mm-hmm. access or something like, and you're basically playing on a big donut. Uh, that so kind of I've, a thing. I've got it here, just in case y'all are wondering. Um, it's actually in square kilometers, so we might have to do some conversion. Oh, yeah, I don't, um, I don't do metric. So, Breath of the Wild is 360 square kilometers, and they compared it to some other games. GTA 5 is 81 square kilometers, and um, Witcher 3 is 135 square kilometers, and Skyrim is 37 square kilometers. Um, so, 360 for a game where you're essentially expected to walk around on foot or at most horseback is pretty freaking huge. Mm-hmm. That would be 139 square okay. miles. Yeah. Yeah. But like, but a, the point that Doc made, it depends on how quickly are you traversing this world. Yeah, if you're traversing really this is. world on foot, which you're expected to do in games like Skyrim or uh, Breath of the Wild mm-hmm. or you know, Horizon. Now, does Breath of the Wild have a horse? Yes, uh, Breath of the Wild has horses, but and the horses do move quicker, but... Not that quick, and okay. nowhere near as fast as a, as a car. Yeah, like these these cars, and of course, nowhere near as fast as a spaceship. Oh, well, of course, right? Spaceships are you can't even you don't you wouldn't even track a spaceship's um, speed in miles per hour because it, it wouldn't mean anything. So does Breath of the Wild have spaceships? Uh, no, no. Okay, I, I consider that a failing of the game. But <laughs> right, uh, right. No, I mean whenever you're talking about something like. Um, Horizon, for example, yeah. where you can you have a mount and you can also fast travel. Um, one of the major problems that I had with that game is that as soon as you get that mount, you realize how small the map really is because they used forced perspective to create an illusion of mountains. Now, oh, mild, see, that's that's too bad. Mild spoiler: I warned you about this yeah. last week. The game is set in Colorado. Oh, okay. Okay. Makes sense. So, uh, whenever you're looking out there, you're looking at actual Pikes Peak. Wait. We're not talking like modern Colorado. Like this is some experiment. No, it's, they're, in, they're in like the Truman Show or something. No, mm-hmm. no, it's 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 post apocalyptic. Okay. It's post post apocalyptic Colorado Springs uh, and Denver. Eloy pulls off a mask. It's Jim Carrey. The problem is that, <laughs> the problem is this: Colorado Springs has twelve buildings. Denver has about twenty four. It's like they took the map, the aerial map of this. Valley, yeah. which there's a new mountain range, okay, which is fine. You can have a new mountain range if a thousand years have passed, and it keeps the whole thing in a valley. But in this new valley mountain range, what you have is a city that is massive. I lived in Colorado Springs for a while. It's huge, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you've scaled it down to an insulting size and then built models on top of it that are, quote-unquote, normal buildings. The, actually, the feeling that I had walking around in this game, once I figured out the scale, was that I was a 50-foot woman. <laughs> I really did. And so you're looking at Pikes Peak, and you're like, wow, it's majestic, and it's glorious, and it's in the distance, and you can walk to it in two minutes, and you can scale it in, in one. Wow. It's tiny, and it's close. That would really break my immersion playing the game. Bingo. So I want to compare that to the aforementioned Mad Max. Right. Uh, which is based on the Fury Road, kind of, sort of. It's kind of a, a prequel, but not it's really. it's got infinite space. Well, it uh, sort of does. <laughs> uh, because, you see, there's this... 
well, first of all, it's set in an ocean, in a dry ocean bed, which is really pretty cool. Um, but there's this one place that you can go and you can sort of drive off into the nothing. And when you drive off into the nothing, uh, a storm will come and you'll start to take damage. And if you don't turn around and go back, then you're going to die. So actually, it's not infinite in the sense that you can't continue going on forever. You see what I mean? Right. But but it was... Until it, you turn was, on invincibility. Well, yeah. But, <laughs> and then we'll really see how infinite it but is. But there was, there was bad marketing done because it, it was sort of announced, ooh, it's, it's, technically it's an infinite game because they want to be the cool game that was the infinite yeah. game. Well, you know what? Even if it is infinite, that's not even very realistic wow. because um, I, I want to be able to, to drive till I get to the other continent, which doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Right. Make it make it circle. Make right. it a. Make I mean, it a, that would be the goal, right? If you're if you're on if you're on, I mean, not the goal is the wrong word. Narratively, but that, would be the that was exactly what he was doing hmm. in the game. He was crossing the thing. So that becomes problematic because hmm. the game tells you you're supposed to do this thing or that he's going to do this thing, and then you try to do this thing and it won't let you. So. I think what I'd like to talk about when it comes to, to size mm-hmm. um, or scale is bigger always better because I'm going to say no. But what do you, but what do you all think? Well, you had to make it dirty, didn't you? <laughs> and I'm referring specifically to the size of games. It's oh. how you use it, Jim. Game worlds. No, but, but seriously, my, my thought on this is that you have to – like it doesn't matter how big your game is if it's empty. I agree. It doesn't matter how big your game is if the content that they're going to be exploring – is boring, or it's not, or it's lacking. That was the problem with, with Daggerfall. It was interesting at that time because you could do a whole bunch of exploration and like people's worlds were set up kind of differently. And there was there were some cool things that it did because it was the first one to kind of experiment with th- with with that kind of style, mm-hmm. like the procedural generation setup. But at the same time, there's a lot of re- repetitive elements, and we saw that with No Man's Sky. A lot of repetitive elements, a lot of things that were kind of the same. Uh, you know, sure, there's all these planets, but how different really are they? I mean, how much how much um, which I'm looking for, um, developer-based content or actual actual developed content is there. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, we, we touched briefly on this when we had um, Alex and Isaac um, yeah. for um, Procedural Generation, and they were talking about it's like not just how big can you make it, but how much interesting content yes, can you have. Yes, thank you. And, and so you look at something like, uh, like Breath of the Wild, again, it's something that we've been playing a lot, so we're talking a lot about it. Um, it is a huge world, but I feel like, and sure, there's, there's areas in the world that are open, by design, you know, mm-hmm. like a big field or something. It's not like everything has to be super tight and there's enemies everywhere. That would be ridiculous. So there are areas that feel like they're emptier, but it fits because it feels like you're in a space, just like how if you were in, you know, certain regions in the U.S. or like in parts of the world, you're just going to have a big open prairie or a yeah. big desert. Yeah. That happens. So I think that it works. They have this balance of of real content, and the world feels like it was very carefully designed mm-hmm. despite the fact that it's very large. So I think... You know, can people get bigger? And, and I feel the same way a lot, a lot of times about GTA games as well in terms of size. I think they do it pretty well. They understand they want to make a large game and they want to give a lot of space for people to play around in. But you don't want to have it be so big that everything has to be spaced out just because you want to say my game is the biggest game ever. Yeah. And then you have to take all the content that you know that you want, that you have the time to make and the resources and the budget to make and that's going to fit your story and your theme. And you take all these little pieces of content and you have to start spreading them out. Spreading them out. And mm-hmm. then just, just so, so that you can say your game is bigger. And now what have you done? You've made a game that is just not as good as yeah, it could have been. Yeah, that's very true. Well, let's put this into perspective, okay? Um, before the big uh, cataclysm happened in World of Warcraft, okay, mm-hmm. that, at that time it was about 80 square miles. Yeah. The, the walkable space of World of Warcraft, the planet of Azeroth, was 80 square miles. Mm-hmm. So that didn't include the island in the middle that's now there. That didn't include all the area in the north. So if you do include all of that, we're over 100 square miles. I think it's like 140. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the point is this. 100 square miles is 10 miles in one direction and 10 miles in another direction on a square. It's 10 by 10. Mm-hmm. We, human beings, um, walk 10 miles easily. Mm-hmm. I mean, fair, fairly, most of us. Gamers, maybe not. Uh, but, but we understand the idea of 10 miles, right? Mm-hmm. Most of what we do, if we like do our shopping, that's within a 10-mile area, that kind mm-hmm. of a thing. That's a, if you imagine that as being our world and then taking everything in that world and just transplanting it into a video game world, that's what we're talking about here. Yes. Whenever we say, you know, 80 or 100 square miles, mm-hmm. That's not that big. No, but but you have to you have to understand that it's it's the players. You don't want to make it to the point where the player feels like it's a chore to move around the space. That's right. And even with something like um, Breath of the Wild, which we found out is about three times the, what your your 
well, about three and a half times because mm-hmm. um, it's about 360. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, wait. Or like, was I doing kilometer version? I don't know. Whatever. The point is it's bigger than that, but not by a, numbers, not by numbers, a math, ridiculous math, math. amount, right? So the point is that it still feels huge. Yeah. Because one, one thing is there's obviously a lot of things in your way. You can't just walk yes. one direction. There's this is a, a technique called compression. Yes. And I guess what we're really talking about here is how much compression is too much compression. And I am arguing mm-hmm. that Horizon Zero Dawn went too far with its compression. Yeah. Basically, if it had been about twice the size or even four times the size, I think it would have been fine. If it had been 12 times the size, that would have been too big. Yeah. I'm not arguing for a one-to-one. I never argue for a one-to-one. No. Okay? And people Here, have been saying that about GTA for a while, talking about why can't, why is the city of, of L.A. not bigger? Why, does, why are they making, And it's because it's, they're it's, ignorant. It, honestly, right. if, if, I, if I walk from my house down to the coffee uh, uh, store, right, the coffee shop that's down on the corner uh, next to the game store and then the comic book store, uh, this is my frame of reference for everything, mm-hmm. it takes me 15 minutes to get there and then 15 minutes to get back. Right. If I'm playing a game and it takes me more than two to three minutes to get to a place, that's too long. Yeah. That's way too long. So what, what, that example right there is a one to five compression, right? Mm-hmm. Three divided by 15 divided by three is five. Anyway. Math um, is hard. Numbers, numbers, math, math, math. <laughs> okay. So, so what I'm really saying here is compression is good. It's a very good thing. And there is an art to making that mountain look like a big mountain, that is there and far away when it's really small and close. The problem comes whenever I can then go to that mountain and climb that mountain and also recognize that it is literal Pike's Peak. Mm -hmm. Skyrim did not have this problem of scaling. For me, I did not feel like a giant walking around. No, no, I didn't either. Because it was a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Zelda is the same way. Yeah, and so I think that there's an element here of they're the, also bigger than Horizon. D- well, too, it sounds significantly, quite but uh, I think there's a danger. Well, even if they're not, that's irrelevant. Right. There's a danger here. Uh, I have a story that I, I used to tell my game design students. Maybe, you, maybe you guys remember it. Um, and it has to do with whenever I went to Italy, mm-hmm. and the Pantheon. In Italy, is a big round building with pillars, right? It, it was actually uh, made for, for all the gods. That's why they called it the, the Pantheon. Mm-hmm. Um, it, was a, it was a Roman temple. And then it was converted into a Catholic church, a Roman Catholic church, as it happens. Um, I have a, a very favorite picture of when I was 20-ish, standing in front of one of these massive, massive pillars. It's like 12 times my height, right? And I took this picture, and I have it hanging on my, my wall at home. Assassin's Creed 2, Ezio, you can go inside the Pantheon. In fact, you can go a lot of really cool places. And I just thought it was so amazing because I go in there. I think that was Brotherhood, actually. I go in there. I stand in front of it, and that pillar is twice his height. Oh. I knew exactly how much the scaling was then. And the way they do it is um, they, they, they pull up the map that they're going to use, if they use any kind of a real map at all in these historical games, they scale it down as they want it to be. And then instead of there being 30 buildings on the block, they do, say, nine. You see what I mean? So the buildings themselves are scaled correctly, but yes. there's not as many on the block. Yeah. The block itself G- GTA is scaled does down. this too. That's exactly That's exactly correct. how GTA does it, yeah. But if you do it everything right as you're looking out across the cityscape, it's not going to look wrong. That's super exactly. hard to do. Exactly. That, is, that is a major it's a skill. artistic yeah. skill. It's yeah. huge. And i got to say, uh, Horizon nails it. Absolutely nails it for that. You take a photo on Horizon, it is beautiful. The, the sunrises are beautiful. Photo mode is an absolute necessity in it. The problem comes when you start to move around and navigate inside of the world and you realize how small everything really is. Do you see what I'm saying mm-hmm. here? There's like a it. balance between yeah. that. It didn't break... Um, it didn't break the Assassin's Creed for me. I laughed because I knew the difference because I, it was one of my favorite photos and I'd been there. But that was a building, not a mountain. And there comes a point with the flashover point where you're like, mm, this is wrong. It just feels wrong. You're like, this mountain should be huge. It should be 12 because times its mountain. size. Right. Not two, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Not two times the size that, of, yes. of me. Yes. And I, no, I, I, can, I can totally see that as a problem and I, and I, I feel that you're right. It is. It is. There's that artistic skill of recognizing just how big it can go 
um, in terms of making it feel like it's a full city, to use GTA again as an example. Yeah. But then also, once you're inside that city and moving around, you don't want to feel like I can get from one point of L.A., to another point of mm-hmm. LA so fast, like the two the, the two you know sides of it, so quickly that it doesn't even feel like a city. Yes. So there's that balance there, and I feel it seems like it seems like Horizon failed that second part. I think um, so. Rockstar and part of it too. I mean, they're they're new to it's this. It's an uncanny as well. it's an uncanny valley kind of thing. Yeah, I know. I agree, and I, I, that's no one of the things it. that I love about yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> about Rockstar and the way that they've handled open world because they've been. I would argue, kind of pioneers of, of, of open world oh, in a I sense, agree. and helped establish a lot of the the conventions of open world mm-hmm. games. So when you have something like Red Dead Redemption or mm-hmm. Grand Theft Auto Five, um, or even Bully, I would argue. I would agree uh, with even that. Even though you're in a much smaller space in Bully, but it works because instead of driving around cars, you're on a skateboard but or a bike. But you know what? The scale in Bully, mm-hmm. I would argue, was about as close to one to one as we've ever seen. I agree. I agree. It, it was it pretty it. If someone told me it was one to one, I would say I would agree. I would just believe it. I yeah. don't know if it was one to one, but it feels cl- so close. I suspect close. it was somewhere in the neighborhood of seventy five yeah. to one, but no point point seven five to one. Yeah. But but honestly, I, it didn't matter. It was it was irrelevant. But they can do that because from the perspective of your character, who's who is a, kid, a child, that's a good point. Who doesn't move around, you know, in, in quickly moving vehicles? That's a good point. It works, yeah. and you're only and you only need to be in that space. But if you're trying to make a game where we're going to explore all this, the old west and this huge area, like in Red Dead, or right. on your horse, explore, yeah, on your horse, or we're going to explore um, greater greater L.A. basically, mm-hmm. and 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 some of the mountainous regions in there, like in GTA V, on your in your car, yeah, you can't have one-to-one scale. It yeah, would take oh. you, like you're saying, if I want to get from one side of the city to another, especially in a game like in GTA... You don't walk that. Right. You, don't, also, you don't walk that. You don't even, even drive that. that. You don't drive that. That's true. No, and there's not, even, there's not even warp points, you know? Right. Like Zelda has warp points on purpose because the fastest you can move is on a horse, uh-huh. and it's really not that fast. Right. So if you want to get from one side of the world to another, it would be very frustrating mm-hmm. to have to travel everywhere. Yeah. Even though you want to travel and you want to explore... If you want to get to like a certain region of the world quickly, you want to use a warp yep. point. So you can at least get to that region, and then you explore that region. That does feel like a litmus test for me. I think you pointed out something really important. Mm. If, you can, if you can walk it, it's probably too small. If you feel like you can't walk it, and I'm talking about the whole map. Here, right, right. Um, if you feel like you can't walk it, or even a region, then there's something epic about that. Think Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. right? And I don't care if you're talking about the movies or the books or the whatever. It took them a year to get from one side of the region, yeah. <laughs> Middle Earth, to uh, you know, to, to to the other side, and then back, you know, from Mordor to home again. It took them six months just to get from one side to the other. Mm-hmm. Just, just that alone makes it feel epic. And in in Mad Max, for example, uh, if you lose your car or uh, you get away from your car, you panic a little bit. There is no way you're walking home. Fortunately, you can send up a flare. And when you do that, then the hunchback will come and he'll pick you up. And so that it's like a solution for that. You still got to drive home and you'd be shot at and uh, all these other things. Is there an app for that? Summon, <laughs> summon hunchback. Yeah. Summon hunchback, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's like, it's like Uber, both hunchback. But, um, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for um, getting out of your car and, and feeling like you're in a place. Mm-hmm. In Mad Max. And and that's the way it is. A whole lot of nothing in Mad Max. You know, you talked about there being a whole lot of nothing. But in that one, it works because that's what it's about. It's yeah. about the bleakness of the post-apocalypse. And, and you had some of that in, in Red Dead. In yeah, certain, you did. Uh, there are lots of areas where it was just wide open space. But wide open that's space. That's important because of the, of the game itself. It's set in the Old West. Yes. You have to feel it. And it also makes it feel like when you come to a settlement, mm-hmm. it's that's a big, big deal. deal. Yeah. Right. That's a very good point. Um, and you're out there and, the, you know, you get ambushed by banditos. Oh, sure. There's no help. Yeah. There's no help. You're, you're there by each you and your horse and your gun and your six bullets and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and if your horse runs off and you, you can't. And he will too. Yeah. And he will. He got spooked and you're not on the horse. Um, you better get rid of those bandits and do something about it and see if you could find another horse because yeah. otherwise you're, you're toast. Man, you're getting me excited about Red Dead 2. <laughs> Man, Red Dead 2. Oh, I know. Is, is Only it, three years. 
Is that <laughs> is it supposed to come out this year? I, it's supposed to. Oh, Next, so year, looking forward. Who to knows? I think it's a two, it's, I think it's a twenty seventeen. So, but. so kind of my counter argument. I'm totally in agreement as far as like from a practical perspective, making it so that it doesn't take the player too long to get across stuff because that would get boring. Yeah. Right? But at the same time, like I play GTA Five, and as soon as you get the jet, for example, like you realize just how small the world really is. Um, that's true, you end up doing U-turns. Um, or they'll talk about it in the game, like, oh yeah, I'm out in this county, and that's like, you know, what, a four-hour drive? And like, you actually make that drive at one point, and it takes you all of, like, maybe 20 minutes, and that's right. the longest minutes, drive yeah. in the game. But and to they, be fair... They, they make it artificially long by making right. it wind up and down the mountain. But that, that jet, you don't really... It's sort of like a non... It's like an optional thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. But you're game, right. Game time. Right. Think about game time. Yeah. In all these games, time is compressed. The the day night yeah. cycle is yeah, like a true. twenty minute thing. And that's right? one of the ways that you can kind of get around. So that, if you yeah. think about that, every second is a minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, or or two. Um and, and it's like, hmm, if you think about it in those terms, then yeah, it really did take twenty minutes or forty minutes or four hours yeah. to get out there. Mm-hmm. If it took four minutes to yeah. get out because that the time is compressed too. And I think that's that's right. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. In a movie, you'd never you'd never see that unless an important mm-hmm. conversation was happening in the car. Mm-hmm. You would never you'd just cut away and you'd be there. Mm-hmm. But kind of my thought is that like I think driving games could do well with this. I think anything that involving flight, that sort of deal. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to see more games that are one to one. And yes, you'd have lots of like big, long, open spaces. But you would design the game such that the hubs of activity are around places that are actually populated. Yeah. Um, and you can make it so they're like, hey, I'm going to drive. If I wanted to, this is kind of like what they did in No Man's Sky that I actually thought was really cool. Um, if I wanted to, I could fly the nine hours from this planet to that planet. But I'm not going to. I'm going to use my warp drive. But, but yeah. my, my, my worry with 1-1 and why I think it just doesn't work. Let's say you're doing GTA in 1-1. Mm-hmm. Right, so I'm in I'm in like the block of a city, okay, and I want to get from one block to another. Mm-hmm. In GTA, that's going to be like, I mean, I can I can sprint and get across there in a few seconds. Mm-hmm. In real life, it's if I if I run if I sprint, mm-hmm. it's going to probably take me like thirty seconds maybe to get to another block, and then and then I'm gassed. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I mean, we're talking sprinting games. And if you think about like if I want to get to like. A building that's mm-hmm. like three blocks down mm-hmm. in GTA because that's where that's the building I have to go to to my next mission. Just three blocks. Mm-hmm. In a current GTA game, current scale, it'll it, it'll only take me a short time, like ten seconds. Right. But if we go one one, it's going to take me minutes to get there. And you see, I would like that because I would like to be able to like have you ha- would like that for like the first few moments. I, 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 you'd make and then it would get real frustrating. Yeah, the game with Jim because you're doing it over. But and the over game and gives over you again. options. The game lets you take a bike, lets you take a car, it lets you. But even it's just, still one one. It even just like lets you quick travel. Say like I want to go from here to well, here, see, and then you. But see now you're throwing in quick travel, and that's something the GTA actually doesn't have on yeah, purpose. That's right. That's a big part of that game is that there is no quick travel. Well, and, so, and, and that's so, why it becomes jalopy. Which is a whole different kind yeah, of game. I think so too. I think that that's not so that's not, not open world. I'm anymore. not saying it's for every game, but I'm saying I'd love to see more games that explore a one to one scale and like really get experimental. If that's what the game was about, I agree. Yeah. But GTA is not the right game. No, for sure. I think something like Bully, that style is is the right game to experiment. Yeah, because he's on a skateboard. Because he's he's a young yeah. child. He, the area that he's able to explore is really small. Mm-hmm. It's a small like like town yeah. that is around one large school kind of building coastal town yeah. yeah real tiny spaces and in that case because you know the square the real square square mile of it is going to be something like a mile mm-hmm. would be the whole size of it then sure play yeah. around with and, and, in and, and, that and, setting, sure. Yeah, but and, definitely and, and, not like a city. Yeah, you don't like actually having, want to have a city. I, I'd, I'd love to have more small settings, too. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it's, you do it a small setting, yeah. I think. Um, but even That'd like, say, say like a driving game. Like, there are games where, like, it's like, oh, we have this many miles of road and stuff like that. Um, and, and, like, the, what starts to annoy mm-hmm. me, especially, is when it's an open world driving game where you're basically just, like, retreading the same roads over and over again. I want those roads to be bigger so that, like, if I feel, if I'm actually driving from one side of the map to the other, I want it to take a long time. When you say driving game, what, what do you mean by that? Like, say Need for Speed. Like a so, racing game. game. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to see if you were considering GTA a driving game. So, like, game. say, for example, like Need for Speed um, Rivals, I right. think it was. And other ones have done this too. But, like, they said it in, I think it's like Redwood County or something like that. Mm. It's a fictional county, but it's like, you know, implicitly like West Coast. Yeah. And so they have a bunch of different biomes. There's like a desert, there's mountainous, there's coastal. Um, and it feels decently big, but then, like, once you've, like, been around the block once or twice, it starts to feel very small. And, like, you start to realize, like, hey, I'm going to go on this awesome, like, marathon race where we're going to go all the way around the map, and it's only going to take, like, 15 minutes. 
Um, I'd love for a marathon race like that to actually be a very, very long race, or maybe even broken up into heats where you go from point A to point B and then from point B to point C, that sort so, of thing. So you're talking more about a racing game where you're you're not getting out of your car and walking. Right. You're, you're driving at, you know, like 200 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of experience. And then you want that to just be basically longer races because mm-hmm. it'll be more of a 1-1. Mm-hmm. I can sort of see that possibly like, uh, working. Need for Speed the Run, for example, yeah. was one where you're supposed to be doing this cross-country race, I think, from like San Francisco to New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and like they, they, Oh, they, God, that they, would take forever. They went much more cinematic scale. with it. And what they did basically is they <laughs> split it up into like, this chapter, this stage, right. is just like, okay, now you need to get through this city in this much time. That sort of thing. Or uh, you're trying to get across this mountain range really quickly or something like that. It's still scaled down. But that's kind of how they solved that. But I would actually really find the game interesting. Granted, you'd have to know what you're getting into. But, like, literally the cross-country race of, like, hey, I'm going to play this racing game for, like, 60 hours, all said. And it's going to be a cross-country race. It's going to literally just be one race that you're doing for 60. I think think that game would have limited appeal <laughs> i'll say sure sure uh, it sounds like it's something that you'd you'd certainly enjoy mm-hmm. and i could certainly see there's certainly would be other people that would like that concept too um <laughs> it's a great compliment there that yes. sounds like something you'd enjoy <laughs> didn't mean it like that i just mean that i don't i think the reason why we haven't seen something like that is because it would be a, a, a niche mm-hmm. appeal like it would be a game with niche appeal that also would take a lot more resources to make mm-hmm. because you're you're actually having to yeah. make the one more yeah. scale. To be fair though, I'm gonna I'm gonna side with Chris on this one and say I would love to see some indie devs experiment with that. However, mm-hmm. they're for, they're for the almost, racing one? Well for it, it, any for, game for the made, one for the one to one idea. For me I'd like to see it them do it for the um like like bully style, like the kid yeah. in a space. It's a small area. You're going one one, but it's maybe like one square mile total. Mm-hmm. That's the sort of thing I'd like to see people experiment because I think you can get away with that. that I makes think sense. you can do that and make it feel like a real place and real scale mm-hmm. without frustration. Well, here's here's an immediate technical issue that you you come up against. Okay, mm-hmm. Google Earth. Okay, the index for Google Earth. You know what I mean when I say that, right? Yes, it's, it's just pure. Data. Mm-hmm. There's no imagery at all in the in the index. Is uh, as of a couple of years ago, when I learned the statistic, half a terabyte. Mm-hmm. Just the index. Okay, and indexes are supposed to be really small because right. that's the point. Uh, so what you end up having is uh, many, 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 many terabytes mm. of. Uh, actual data for for Google Earth, and that's before they started going high res with stuff. I don't have any idea what it's up to now. Uh, that was just the statistic whenever I taught it. So uh, you you start dealing with all of the HD mm-hmm. and and 5K and all those new terms I don't even know <laughs> with all but, the gaming, and it's like suddenly you've run into this massive problem of data. Yeah. So you could you could make it you could have, still have your racing you know, cross country game, mm-hmm. but instead it's gonna be like, you know, Tron style mm-hmm. where it's just these geometric shapes yeah. with like glowy mm-hmm. sides on mm-hmm. it, then maybe we could do that. Mm-hmm. Which I'm cool with. I'm I'm cool with like, you know finding clever ways to work around these issues, like making it stylized graphically or um you know, like even like you were saying like with uh what was it? Um fuel. It's yeah. like if you actually slow down, you see that it's like a really terrible looking world, but you are going so fast. Yeah, the trees are flat time. and pixelated, yeah. and it's awful. Mm-hmm. But while you're racing, yeah. you know you're not you're not looking at that. You're just looking Glorious. at the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so if if anybody wants a visual on this stuff, um, what I recommend is doing an image search. I did a I did a Google image search for large video game worlds. Mm-hmm. That's your phrase, large video game worlds. Okay. And what's cool about it is. Uh, don't there, misspell anything in that. Just be careful. Yeah, Don't just type exactly. in large and hit enter. <laughs> the, the the Mary Sue originally had this um, cool image that was basically inset, and it had a GTA up in the in the top left corner at its. Uh, I don't think they. I don't uh, think this, they this made was that GTA three. I think they just shared it. Well, they, they shared it, but um, it's like uh, it's three square miles, and then it shows that compared to G, you know GTA San Andreas, which is thirteen square miles, and then Oblivion and Far Cry and Warcraft, and they're all inset inside each other. I think it's all the way out to Just Cause 2 in 2010, which is about when this image was made. Um, and Just Cause 2 ends up being uh, 20, was it 400 square miles? And then it says even larger and doesn't show them and has a list of, of even larger yeah. stuff, like Lord of the Rings, which sat 
wonderfully at 30,000 square miles, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's another image that um, the Reddit guys have, have taken and run with, and it, it almost makes it comedic at how inset the inset insets become mm-hmm. um, with even larger and even larger and even larger. This one here. Um, yeah, that's the one. Uh, so I, I pulled it up on a giant bomb. Nice. I was just curious because whenever we reference images, I'd like to reference whoever made it. Mm-hmm. Um, I see it in giant bomb, but I don't think they made it. It looks like it's, it says, according to this, Sean Elliott was the original person that tweeted the comparison images. Okay. However, it seems like it originally came from some anonymous source on Reddit. Right. So there that's, you go. That we're, just, we're just going to have to source Sean Elliott and anonymous source on Reddit, I guess. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, if you're interested in, yeah. in sort of a visual of everything we've been talking about to really grasp the scale, um, once you start talking about Daggerfall, um, GTA 3 becomes a pixel in that image. Yeah. Just one pixel. Yeah, it's very, very And tiny so that's the kind of scales we're talking about here. You know, so if you really think, oh, well, they should just make a one to one. They can't. Um, even when you try to do something as procedurally generated as uh, you know, 18 quintillion mm-hmm. worlds, what you end up with is a bunch of 50 square mile worlds that all look the same, right. basically. And it, it ultimately, it boils down to the user experience. So mm-hmm. it's just finding that right balance between um, what size world do you need to tell your story. That's right. And I think you could do some interesting things. Or does in, the player need to tell their story? I agree. Ah, yeah. This yeah. and last there week. There you go, last week. Depending on the game, though, kind of like in a, in a way sort of like bringing the game to the player in cases. Mm-hmm. So you have like sort of the hubs where you have a lot of design stuff, but then like, you know, Final Fantasy XV, just as an example, you're driving across country and then all of a sudden a drop ship comes and you have to do an encounter there in the middle of the road. And then back across um, the country so, and then back across <laughs> it again mm-hmm. and then the same space but, again. But point being that like, you know, say if I'm making a really long road trip between like you know one major hub and the other one I can still have gameplay sort of like coming at me that as I'm would doing be that. amazing and again I say I would love it if the map for FF15 was mm-hmm. actually just a big snake mm-hmm. we're talking like 300 miles of Route 66 ish mm-hmm. kind of a thing mm-hmm. and again back to what we were saying before if it's a fantasy world you don't have to worry yeah. about whether or not it's a one to one scale because you're like that mountain in the distance wow it's wonderful and I got there in two minutes but that's and fine the fact of the matter is that when we're playing this we, we tend to start to ignore the scale we, like, we're not pay, really paying attention until you sort of see the thing that kind of like makes a click in your head like oh this is really tiny Yeah. just as an example when you finally get to the end of Final Fantasy 15 mm-hmm. and they show you like that screenshot of like oh look here's the whole world and then you see like oh yeah that one like restaurant off of the shore like I could Compare that in size to like a, a prefecture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I, I like I yeah. could take this and transplant it someplace, and it would not make sense. Right. It wouldn't work. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's. It's like it's like you're saying. We, they just have to be mindful of keeping the player, you know, immersed in the game and convinced that whatever scale that they're supposed to believe is the case works mm-hmm. is actually the case. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. they, so it's just keep keep them in the game and. and it's very easy to knock them out of that experience. We're yeah. seeing that with, I mean, you're seeing that rather with Horizon, is mm-hmm. that you kind of got taken out of that because by the time you reached that space, you were just able to leap up this you know, tall mountain too quickly. You were able mm-hmm. to get to it too fast. Mm-hmm. So it's a delicate balance. You know, I've seen the actual Death Star, the one that was used in the movies. Mm-hmm. It was on tour, and I went and got, got to see it. It's about a six-foot ball. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing. It was mm-hmm. intricate. It was wonderful. It worked. They filmed it. They did all the things they were supposed to. And once it's transferred over into that screen, we believed that it was the size of a moon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's no moon. <laughs> but whenever you try to it's use those... To be a space station. Yeah, that's right. When you try to use those tricks in video games, it works until you walk into the matte painting. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. Once you hit the back wall, the invisible wall, the whatever... It breaks. And that's what we need to remember. There needs to be a narrative reason for not doing it. Honestly, I, for all of AC's faults, I think Assassin's Creed has done one thing beautifully. And it's this character never went there. You are going to desynchronize if you try to go to this part of London or Rome or Florence because it's outside of the area. You can for about five seconds and then you desynchronize. You die. Because that character never did that. And that's just not stored in his genetic memory. It makes sense. It works narratively. Yeah. Yeah, and then of course there's there's the um just straight up having gates and boundaries within your game, which I know GTA does that with you know, you have like the ocean or you have like a, a mount a mountainous cliff that you can't climb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you know what? I loved the way San Andreas did that early in the game. Yeah. You could swim to the other island, but if you did, they called the SWAT team on oh, you. Oh, I remember that Everybody too. That was great. showed up. Yeah. And we're like, oh, geez, I'm just running around. I need to, I need to, what do I need to do? I don't know. <laughs> they, they threw that joke in because that was the first one that you could um, swim. Swim, swim in. That's right. Before, they used the ocean just to block you. So, of course, they so knew. You, you drowned and died. Yeah, and they knew that gamers were going to go, well, I can swim now. I'm just going to break it and go to the next part. Ha ha, rock. Rockstar, yeah. and of course, Rockstar being the savvy devs that they are, they uh-huh. planned for it mm-hmm. and just stick the SWAT, SWAT team on you right but away. You know what? That works for the tone of the game. Oh, totally. It works for the totally. meta of the game. Yeah. Everything works whenever they do that. Mm-hmm. So, um, know yeah, your game. But but whenever you have, um, I'm going to pick on Horizon again. Mm-hmm. Uh, whenever you have both invisible walls and also a warning that you've gone out of the zone and also resets your game for you whenever you do it anyway. That's too much. Yeah. That's just yeah. that's just insult to injury, man. So, like, you know, for example, in Zelda, you know, I, I was exploring part of the Gerudo Desert, and I was just like, oh, hey, look, I've gone sort of, like, past the point that clearly the wind should be. I'm going to see how far into the desert I can go. You can't get very far before, like, you know, kind of, like, the wind starts picking up. It's like, oh, it's going to be the dumb, it's like, you know, the, there's a storm perpetually surrounding the play area mm-hmm. thing, which is always a little bit of a cheat, but at least it makes a little bit more sense than just the invisible wall. But then, you know, I just got to a point where it's like, okay, you can't go any further. It just, like, pops up with the text, and you can't walk any further than that. And oh, so, eventually that's that's how they handle it in the yeah. desert. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of places where it's kind of like natural boundaries, like, for instance, an ocean that you can't swim out further. A mountain you can't boat. climb. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, like, that's, like, the one time I've run into that. Yeah. But it's also, like, I, I went out there knowing that that was the end of the world. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So, like, there was, like, I, I wasn't expecting anything. Yeah, I've right. been out to Gerudo, and I've explored a lot of the desert out there mm-hmm. and never got to that point. But I could totally see how if you just keep just being ridiculous eventually they have to do something yeah. mm-hmm. and all well, games have to have a solution for it because well, yeah. the game itself isn't infinite that's right well, except for Mad Max except for Mad Max right. of course yeah. Of course. <laughs> which ended up doing the storm that damages you in the end so yeah. it wasn't actually infinite uh, but you know World of Warcraft um, if you swim out too far then a stamina meter kicks in mm-hmm. and then if the stamina meter goes down you drown Yeah, which is really an interesting solution because you can swim along the coast infinitely around the edge of the yeah, the continent. But if you go out into the ocean, the mechanics literally change mm-hmm. and adjust to teach you the lesson you need to without breaking that fourth wall at any time. Mm-hmm. Um, whew, we could do a whole other episode on this, but we're yeah, out I of think time. It's getting too big. Yeah, <laughs> we scale it back. We need to scale it back yeah. down. Yeah, we'll do a one to one scale <laughs> well, on our. We're top. hitting that invisible wall <laughs> called time. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 96 of the backward compalbcom podcast, our talk on scale. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. I'll let you have that one. I'm Jim. You did. Yeah, you, you, I got confused. You looked at me, and I was like, what? And there's this awkward call back to the beginning of our episode, of course. I know. I, right? I got that. Okay. Yeah. You know, if you take 96 and you turn it upside down, it's 96. Say it. Numbers. We want you to write into the show, because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Compatible. A superb wine. Ew, God, that's <laughs> weird. <laughs> it's just like the slurps out. <laughs> that is so. so- <clears throat> <laughs> Superb wide. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't do it. Uh, just stop. Just stop the recording.